I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, uh, m what was my dissertation, possibly the first one done entirely in comics form, and is now this book from Harvard University Press. Um, so to start it out, uh, I want to give you a little bit about my backstory. So just to say, I didn't show up at Columbia and say, I'm going to do this thing in comics. I, I was already making comics before that. Um, and so as a kid, as maybe many of us my age were, I had a much older brother who read comics to me, and so I'm one of those people whose first word is Batman, which I, I have managed to replicate in my daughter um, already. You know, I, I, as an educator, we think a lot about comics as a literacy tool, and I can say, at least anecdotally, my own education, you know, very much learned to read very early from reading comics. So I think that's a very important thing about them. And so I was really into them, really into making them, and I made my own superhero uh, comic or sort of parody, somewhere in between parody and, and semi-real superhero thing um, that I did through high school, who makes a reappearance in my dissertation as a, a he makes a little cameo, at Locker Man. But when I got to undergraduate, I, I wanted to do intellectual things. And at the time that I went to undergraduate, comic books were not the thing that you do as intellectual work. And so I did mathematics, as Faya noticed. I studied mathematics, and uh, comics kind of stayed in the background for a while. And I want to say one thing about that. I'm really pleased that I studied mathematics. But um, if you tell somebody at that time, you say, hey, I study math, and they'll say to you, oh, you're so smart. Um, and so now, you know, I say, oh, I make comics, I make this art. They look at it and they say, oh, you're so talented. Um, yeah, you get it. So I think what's really true about that is that I was a very talented mathematician. Um, I really knew how to figure things out, but I'm not sure how well I understood everything. And I think at this point, my art is way smarter than I am without it. But I think we have this distinction between them built into our culture, and I think that's something that this work pushes back against. So I think even in my own development, I spent a lot of time thinking that the work I did in comics was just this kind of fun thing that I did on the side. And now I got to do the highest level of schooling and did this as my work. So things have changed, and, and now I get to teach people who then teach their students to use comics. So I'm really pleased that they've changed. But I even see it in my own lifetime that I had to come around to that point of view. So anyway, as I said, I, I, the comics kind of moved to the background. I kept making them but not finishing them. And in my time in Detroit, uh, around the 2004 election, um, because of this arts magazine I ran, I was asked to be in a political art show. And I made this, I had only a few days, so I made a comic for it. And this really triggered my return to comics and, and a lot about the style that I work in. And instead of sort of explanatory things, I turned to using visual metaphor as a way to get across ideas. So this one is about voting or, you know, a show of hands. Um, and so that play of the visual metaphor became my, my primary way of working. Um, shortly after that, I did the essay for an exhibition we organized on games and art entirely in comics form. So it covers the history of games, the rules of them, and sort of becomes a philosophical piece. And, and what I found in that is that I had this really deep way to educate people without simplifying it. I think when I say I do my work in comics, people tend to assume it's sort of the idiot's guide to whatever. And I actually think, and hopefully you'll be convinced by the end of this, that you can do more sophisticated stuff by the way you can layer images and have images speak to text and all those juxtapositions. So when I, I decided to come back to school uh, and uh, was trying to get into Columbia, I said, this is the kind of work I want to do. This is what I'm going to, this is what my work is going to be. This is a way that I'm going to be in academia but reach people who aren't necessarily in it, which was always a concern of mine. Um, so the minute I got there, I started making my work in comics form. So I really sort of made the case for it by doing my homework in comics. I had professors who knew nothing about that, but they were open to it. Um, and this, this was, uh, as anybody in the audience familiar with the philosopher of, aesth of aesthetic education, Maxine Green? It's quiet. One. Well, you should be. And I made several comics about her. Um, she was in her 90s when I first had her, and uh, 96 when I had my defense. Um, but I made this uh, comic about Maxine, and she, it's on my site. It's, she's really a wonderful person, talks about the transformative power of the arts. So I did that, and this, this is the last one we'll show before we get to unflattening. This was for a book on narrative research, and, and this was a comic that, depending on who you asked, was either about drawing, or about doing research, or about seeing. And to me, that was really a key to my work, is to have the metaphors 
be be so much about one thing and another thing at the same time that it really depended on how you read it, what you thought it was about. And that was okay to me. That was a way to give people access to it. So if you were into drawing, you could get into this and maybe get the larger point. Um, but if you were into research, you got to it from a different direction. And that, that really became how I went with unflattening and a lot about what I meant by unflattening. So, to talk about unflattening, I really want to start by telling you what I mean by flatness. And by flatness, I didn't mean something literal. I meant this sort of, uh, I meant patterns of thought, patterns of behavior that we're trapped in. Um, a place where we sort of forget what might be and we're trapped in how it is. You know, we have lots and lots of options in life, but maybe they're already chosen for us. And because I had this word unflattening, um, I was thinking about it in terms of comics, and I'll come to that later, I, I turned to Flatland. And I'm guessing folks are familiar with the 1880s uh, novella Flatland by Edwin Abbott. Regardless, uh, it's, this, it's the tale of the geometric inhabitants of this two-dimensional world. So they know how to move east and west and south and northwards, but they have no concept of upwards. They can't conceive of anything that's off the plane. And so we can all t look at Flatlanders and put our heads down and say, oh, that's kind of silly, you know? But, but what, is, what is upwards for us? What are the directions we can't go, the dimensions we can't, we can't think about because we lack that way to see them? And that became a real burning question, you know, how do we get out of the, the, the narrowness of our thinking? And I think, and I'm in a school of education, I think a lot of what's going on in the institution of education is causing a kind of flatness. Education as recipe, education as a, a series of steps of things done to us rather than things explored. I don't think it's intentional, but I think it's, it's the nature of this institution. Um, and I think it's everything from our learning being put into boxes, whether it's the boxes of subject, the boxes of time, the boxes of space. You know, learning gets all in these little boxes. And so I think we start to take those boxes into ourselves. And so somebody who studied art and studied mathematics and maybe happened to play professional tennis is seen as an odd thing. But I think really we're all very complex creatures and it's the boxes that are artificial. And so it's, it's really a pushback against those boxes and at things being lined up in rows. And specifically, it's asking why does 12-point font, double-spaced, one and a half by one by one by one margins, why is that what learning looks like? Why is that what counts as scholarship? It's not to say that's not good. It's not to say there's something wrong with it, but to say why is that the form that counts and everything else doesn't? And I think we can go back, and on this page I do, as far back as Plato and his distrust of images as shadows of shadows. And we can look at Descartes, and we won't spend time on Descartes, but Descartes completely throwing out the senses and say that we're thinking machines. And certainly these rows of text work well for thinking machines, but maybe not so well for how complex humans are. And it's to say anytime you want to represent the complexity of our experience, you have to flatten it. You can't have the whole world every time I'm talking to someone else. So we can think about in the top there, the Mercator projection of the globe, which you're all familiar with. When you flatten it out to make the map, you know that Greenland's not that big. You know that these kind of distortions happen. And so you can look in the center there. This is Buckminster Fuller's Dimaxia map, where he puts it onto a, the globe onto an icosahedron and then sort of pulls it apart that way. And in his map, you see connections where the other one has divisions. And that's not to say it's any more accurate. It's just to say that these are different ways of flattening it out. We can think about it in terms of the weather. If I ask you what the weather's like and all you tell me the temperature, you're leaving out the humidity, which makes an enormous difference in Washington, D.C. You're leaving out the wind, which was nice to find here. You're leaving out the sun. You're leaving out all these things. So if we're only coding by one channel, we leave out all these other ways. And so maybe my biggest question became, you know, what, are we, what are we failing to see? What are we missing when we're only allowing one way of thinking in our classrooms, in our scholarship? And what might we start to make visible when we bring in other ways of thinking? And so I, I had an aside here. Um, I talk a lot about ways of seeing. And, and by ways of seeing, I really meant ways of knowing. It, but, but I'm quite literally talking about seeing because it's about comics and it's about visual thinking. Um, but I wanted to sort of explain that I meant this in a broader sense. So I introduced my dog into the book which may be another first for dissertations. I don't know how many times they get drawn in. So we all know that the dog's sense of smell is uh, stronger than yours and mine, right? You know this. But what's really important about the dog's sense of smell is that it's more nuanced than yours and mine, which means I come up to this podium and I can see that it's cream colored, right? It's cream colored, it has certain kind of edges, I can see the size of it. 
But that's about it. A dog comes up to this and it knows who was here a couple hours ago, if anyone was, who spoke here maybe yesterday, the day before, maybe as far back as seven days. The dog has access to those layers of time that you and I do not have and can't have. So I see that the dog has a kind of upwards that we just don't have. And it's not to say we should develop it, but it's to say when we think about what learning looks like, we need to incorporate those ways that people have access to upwards that we don't and make them part of learning. I know I'm very much specifically talking about comics and visuals here, but, but it's really to say how do we get these ways of knowing into what our learning is? And so unflattening is this ridiculously simple idea. I almost get a little embarrassed when I explain it out loud. Um, you all know this, but I don't think we think about it. I look through this eye, and I look through this eye, and they're not telling me the same thing. And they have to get along. I have to get along so I don't bump into things. And they get along so that I can have a more dimensionalized uh, view of the world. And obviously, you can, this is also true of the fact that we move. Um, and this is a way we figure out the distance to the stars. We look out at the stars from the Earth today, and we look six months later, and it allows us to have two eyes very, very far apart. And I think that very simple idea of displacement, to move from your singular point of view to another point of view and keep those views connected and keep them speaking to each other, I think that is how we grow. And I think that's a big issue that we face today is how do we take other perspectives alongside our own so that we can change them. And I think we don't need to stop at two. This is not simply about you have to have two. It's how many different ways can we look? How many different perspectives can we include? Different ways of working. And when we do that, I think instead of seeing things head on, we see that they have sides. We see that they can be turned over, turned upside down, turned around, and be opened up. So for me, comics was not only this way that I love to work, but it was a way to be amphibious, breathe in the worlds of both image and text at the same time, and maybe find ways to step out of the boundaries of my own thinking, and maybe get a look at them and find some other ways to do my work. So we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about comics right now. I, I won't do a huge history on that. I could have, but, but we won't here. But I think comics, you know, we're seeing this as sort of a new thing. I mean, people are very excited. The movies make people very excited about it. We see comics as this, you know, this sort of novel thing. Why hasn't there been a dissertation in comics form? Why hasn't Harvard published one before? I think the, the excitement about that is, is, very, is very good. But in some sense, comics as they are have been around longer than film. And I think even more importantly, I think our ways of making sense of the world through images are as old as we've been human. And I think that's something when we think about what goes on in classrooms, you know, we're, we're still okay with art up on the walls, but art as a way of figuring out our world, art as a vital literacy, that's been left out. And I think it's kind of a travesty and something I hope, you know, something I hope I can speak to. Because this is really very much one of the things I think that makes us human. But let's talk about comics very specifically right now. Folks in this room heard of Scott McCloud's 1993 comic about comics, Understanding Comics? I see some nods. If you're interested in comics and you want to do something with them either as maker or teacher, um, it's a great book to start, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. Um, not the place to finish, because there's lots more going on about how comics work, and I know there's comic scholars in the audience. Um, but it's really, it's a wonderful place to start, and I think the big deal about Scott's book in 93 um, is that it opened up people to stop thinking about comics as a genre and much more about what could I do with this form, what are different ways I could approach it, and I think we've seen that since then. We've seen all kinds of comics. And I think for me, it was, if I, in your introduction, you said something about why not, and I think my approach to doing my dissertation in comics was more of it was less an effort to be radical and more an effort to see why not. Uh, Mouse, for people who would know Art Spiegelman's Mouse, had come out, and uh, Persepolis uh, by Marjan Satrapi had come out, and Understanding Comics, and many, many things had come out. So I'm like, I feel like this argument had been won, but it still has to be fought some more, and probably will still have to be fought at many other places for a while. But anyway, comics specifically. Um, so we'll start with Scott's definition. I think it's a nice starting point, and then we're going to move past that. Uh, so he says, juxtapose pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. So basically that means, here's my fist. I'm going to draw a box around it, and then I'm going to stretch it out here. I'm going to draw a box around it. You guys are all going to make the action happen. Nothing ha comics are static. Nothing moves. Nothing, they're, they're like the flattest kind of thing you can get. But 
because of the way our eyes connect the dots there, we make the action happen. Uh, the reader animates it. And his big idea is about comics as this sequential form. And I've represented it here with the change in seasons. And you know, there's that sense of time moving from this to this to this to this. But, so you can see it in this page. So we read left to right, top to bottom. But because it's visual, you can't help but see the whole thing at the same time, which means you're starting to make connections, whether you want to or not, from the lower right back up to the upper left. And that whole page is holding together in a way that changes it in some ways. And in, in fact, within any single panel, you're connecting, you know, do you read the box first or do you read where the, where the marmot, I forget what that, it's Ricky Ticky Tabby, where that is, um, you know, which part comes first? And maybe I'll ask you guys a question first. When you read comics, who reads the words first? Okay, who reads the pictures first? All right, third option. Anybody got a third option they want to voice? Both. Depends on the picture, it depends. Any, any third options? Anybody do the page first as a whole and then? You probably do whether you know you do it or not. Thank you. Oh, hey, thank you. So that's a pretty interesting question, the fact that this sort of hierarchy of reading, which, you know, if it, this was a novel, you would say, yes, I read this way. This is how you read, has been sort of broken up and it's much more interconnected and all at once. So I think that idea that comics are both sequential and simultaneous is where they get really exciting, at least for me. And that's what we're going to get into. So this is a one page from Watchmen, which is a very celebrated comic, or maybe it's a graphic novel. And so that center panel, which I've blown up here, he says, there is no future, there is no past, do you see? And I think that is intentional meta-commentary on how comics work. So in some sense, we could say that upper left panel happens first, and the lower right panel happens last. And that's, in some sense, yes, you do read that way. But in fact, the lower right hand, hand panel comes 30 years before the upper left. And time and space are sort of mashed together in an unusual sort of way here. And we can think about that. I think about it in terms of how our brain works. And I think we have, we have two kinds of awareness. And, uh, and that is, we're aware of the sequential moments. Like you've come to this talk, you've got something else you've got to do in an hour, you've got, you had something you did this morning. So you're experiencing time in a fairly linear fashion. But at the same time, you're also having things I've said that are making thoughts go off to the side here or other thoughts about what you're gonna do later in the day. So while we move through time in a somewhat linear fashion, or maybe we don't, but let's assume we do, we sort of wander in our thoughts in many directions at the same time. So I think that interlacing of sequential and simultaneous that comics do, do a really good job of capturing something about how things go on in our heads. And so here's some examples from comics that aren't mine that I think speak to that. So this is a comic about the Louvre. Um, and if we cut it up into nine panels and I showed it to you as a slideshow, I think you'd miss something. And I think you see the sort of super image that's going on behind that. And if you know the Louvre and the pyramid and all that, um, that's significant part to the storytelling. But when do you read it? You know, did you read that first? Did you read it or did that come to you all at once? I mean, that's changing the reading. This is Gasoline Alley from 1930s. And we can see our characters sort of bumbling along sequentially through it, um, but it's a single simultaneous scene. So those two ways of thinking are going on at the same time. And we'll do one more, and it's a joke, so I'll wait till you get it. That was fast, somebody over there. So the only way this little guy can get the fruit is because time and space are mashed up in this unusual way. Um, and I think that, that really is a very exciting thing about this form. You can't, in a film, for all films, great powers, it's hard to move backwards in the film. Film, you have to go at the pace of the cogs or whatever it is now of how the film turns. And so for me, I, I'm very interested in comics in, as a way to not illustrate things, but to embody them through the visuals. So this is a page from a chapter on ruts or routine, and I was contrasting my wife's commute in Manhattan, which was different every day in different places and always, always changing with the typical commute, which is we go out and we go back, we go out and we go back. And so instead of putting one here and the other here, in the background, the grid has the out and back. And so there's this sort of base thing that happens the whole time. But in the foreground, 
I had noticed or the, the sort of connection between Manhattan shape and a, a falling leaf or a falling feather. And I was thinking about how her route was sort of adrift or the Situationist Internationale's derive. She was sort of drifting through the city. And so I have the contrast of her drift and I mapped it out differently on all those against that background. So the page is both, I guess, illustrating it, but it's also doing those things at the same time. And I think that's a really exciting potential for where comics can go. This is not from the book. This is from a, a piece I did for the Boston Globe last year. It's a piece about entropy, and you don't, it never says the word entropy, but that's what it's about. It's about how things fall apart, whether sand runs down or your coffee gets cold, but it's also about the few moments where things spin back up against that stream of downhill. And so it's sort of about these vortices. So the shape of it itself does a lot of that thing, and in fact, this comic, the middle section, you sort of read down, and then you come to the center, and then you come back out. So it asks you to read right to left in one section, and it asks you to read back up, which is difficult to do, and it was insane to figure out. I don't recommend it. But I think that question of changing what, the way we read, changing the direction you read, I mean, that's, that's a pretty unusual question. When you read things, where, where, you know, when do those moments happen? I think that's something we really can play with and, and do a lot of things about our thinking in comics. And so that, that becomes a question, is what do our thoughts look like? You know, before you put them out into some form, what do your thoughts look like in your head? I know it's kind of a big room, but I don't, can I ask, a, I'm gonna ask another question. Does anybody wanna say, what does your thoughts look like before you get them out? Is anybody bold enough to throw that out into a room of strangers at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C.? Has anybody got a? I've gotten spaghetti before, I've gotten fireworks. There's no answer that's gonna really hurt my feelings. But we can think, oh, I got a brave soul over there. Ratatouille. What's that? Ratatouille. They look like Ratatouille, the movie or, or the food? <laughs> so uh, uh, give me a couple more words with that. I'm a little slow. Mixed, so mixed, so I like that, so there's mixed. All right, does anybody want to build on that or say their own answer? Yeah. I see pain as color and challenge. You see pain? I see pain as a geometry. It's not a solar All right, so we've got ratatouille, we've got geometry, and sir? I would say sand falling down the hill like I'm doing, and it kind of has an avalanche effect. You move downward, build up, out of the bottom. Got it. All right. So we get one more. Is anybody brave enough on this, or we're? I'm gonna say mashed potatoes. Me saying spaghetti probably triggered a lot of that, didn't it? Um, <laughs> mashed potatoes. All right. Fair enough. I mean, I think there's no. Does anybody want to say rows and rows of text? Really? That's it? That's all you got going on in there, Mike? Maybe. I think um, we'll stick to Ratatouille and other things, but um, I, I think we can say for sure, it's probably not rows and rows of text, but I really, I like to think about them because I like to cherry pick my answers here, is that I think there's very much, we do have linear moments, we do have sequence going on, but we also do have the sort of sideways tangents that I think comics can handle so well. And so this, this is Chris Ware, contemporary, extremely famous contemporary cartoonist. I think his, his comics talk about the way to capture fragments of memory in these sort of little images, and they move off to the side. And I think you can think about this. When you try to get your thoughts out, maybe you're having a hard time writing it down, but you go out for a run, and like things, when you're moving, things start to make sense. And I think that act of movement, that act of finding other directions to go, allows your mind to find the ways that it needs to. Whether, whether you end up making comics or whether you bring it back down to a textual form because you have to is a different question. So on one hand, I think comics are this extremely powerful way to represent the complexity of our thinking. And the flip side of it is I think they're an extremely powerful way to generate our thinking. And that's, that's what I want to sort of wrap with here. So the, your eyes at every second are darting about probably about three times a second and they're finding edges and they're finding things that they notice and they're making relationships. I know that she's sitting in front of that empty chair. I know I'm, I'm doing all these things that I, I can't even tell that I'm doing it, but we're doing it all the time. And so the minute you make a mark on a piece of paper, this relationship engine that's going on all the time starts to see things in the drawing, starts to see things that you didn't anticipate. So I said it earlier, but I really do think my comics are smarter than I am because 
I have this partner that I work with. I start making marks and my visual system starts to interact with the things I made and I start to have this conversation that teaches me a lot about where the work needs to go. So it's when I engage both the sort of, I'm thinking about things, but I'm making them and seeing them. You know, your eyes are very powerful and we don't, you know, the visual system is very powerful. We, we don't know it because it, it works so automatically. So people ask me all the time, what do you think of first, words or pictures? And I say, yes. And it's, it's not, I mean, it's funny, I think, but it's true because the page evolves from this play of having the words and having pictures and seeing how they connect in ways that I didn't anticipate. It's making, it's deciding that this page is, this is a page about the lousy name that comics have and it's playing with uh, Shakespeare's, and here I substitute Rose for comics, by, by any other name would smell as sweet. I've decided at the beginning every, pa every panel is going to have something to do with a rose. And, you know, I draw a juncture or I draw this two forking branch and that becomes the juncture. Did I think of the juncture first and think of the image or the other way around? I don't even remember anymore. But each of those things is triggering the other. And the work, in some sense, I'm, I'm not a mystic at all, but I feel like when you trust that, when you start to let the pictures and words and spatial orientation of them, they start to teach you where to go. And I, some, sometimes I really felt like I just held on and let the work go where it needed to. And I was really happy. Harvard reproduced uh, uh, many of the early sketches in the back of the book. Um, this is the very first sort of outline, which is exciting to me just because you can kind of see some of the things I anticipated, some of the things that didn't happen. But why I really like it is I think to people who don't draw or people who don't make music or whatever, that when you see finished work, it looks like magic. You walk through the gallery and like, oh my goodness, this is magic. I could never do that. But I think if we see the sort of mess that is the thinking, and that's the other important point. This isn't like a drawing of my thinking. This is my thinking. My work doesn't exist without this. I, I couldn't make it without having done this. And honestly, if I had written the book and then drawn pictures to it, it would have been a completely different work. Um, it had to be made this way. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing it the other way. It's just saying that it would be a different thing. But I think seeing the sort of the, the way we figure our way into the work is really important to make this something that other people can do. And I think we all can do it. So I want to give you one very specific example from the book, and then uh, we'll wrap it up here. In the chapter on imagination, I, I had a page about stories, the transformative power of them. And very early on, I thought I would do it on Scheherazade and the, uh, the Thousand and One Nights tale. And so that seemed like a productive thing, and I was playing with this idea that the sort of page would have stories within stories, and it would zither across in the way that Scheherazade's name did. And it, I would have these little zooms, uh, if folks are familiar with the book Zoom, where they're in a postcard, and then we zoom in, and they're watching TV, and we keep going. Or Powers of Ten, the film and the books, where they're... Anyway, I would have these literal or metaphorical zooms. But midway across the page, I wanted to say, by stories, I don't just mean the fanciful, but I also mean things like science. So had I been writing, I would have probably said, and by stories, I also mean things like science, and I'm able to put a period on it. But because, as I said earlier, I'm much more interested in embodying the work through the visuals and in the structure of the page, I had to find something that both suited this visual structure I was building and also was science. So I started looking in, in you know, started digging into what had been done in the time the Knight's Tales were written down and in the, you know, in the Arab Golden Age is where they were written down. And I stumbled across uh, a work by a man named Altusi whose astronomical figurations were later used by Copernicus to do his big revolution. So I was over the moon because I'd already had a page on Copernicus in which the sort of main point was that nothing changed except the point of view which changed everything. So I was like, all right, I had this page on Copernicus. Things are coming, and so I spent about three weeks learning, the, you know, learning what he'd done in the astronomy, trying to figure out how I could make it work with the structure that I'd built of the page. To come out to what is those three lower panels there, so nothing in my notes said you should learn obscure Arab astronomy of the 1300s. That's not part of my proposal, not part of my notes, but what did tell me to do it is that I had to go from there to there and I had to make, I had to have something that talked about science through the pictures and it had to actually teach the science too. It couldn't just be, let's throw Einstein in there because that's the easy thing to do. It had to actually be a real thing. So the work taught me where to go and took me in directions that I didn't expect to go. 
And I think that's a really crucial point about saying why this is important. And I want to sort of turn the corner as I close this to say a few words about uh, my students. I'm going to show you one example. Um, so I, most recently, uh, I taught this class comics as a way of thinking. And I primarily have had non-drawers or self-described non-drawers in my class. But we make comics from the first day, and we make work for their finals, and we keep doing it. And I find across the board that the act of making changes how they think and changes where they go with their work. And it doesn't matter about the skills. So the work I'm going to show is by someone I'm guessing you probably wouldn't put up at the National Gallery, necessarily. Because um, this was a very shy student. It was really difficult to get her to speak much in class. But did these extraordinary stick figure comics where she, her thinking just poured out. So like if we graded this on the basis of her artistic skills, ah, you know, that's not, wouldn't count. And if we graded it on grammar or whatever other rubrics we have in the world, it would be hard to say. But if we think about what she did in her thinking, this is one of the most extraordinary things that I've seen. And I'm only showing you a fragment from it. She did all this play with the boxes, these things that were, which is very much about comics, these things that trapped her. And the whole comic, you don't see her face to the last page, which I'm not going to show. But she's moving through her thinking. I'm going to read the last page. So she makes her own box out of words, sounds, and pictures. And soon she learns that there is no need for borders, that borders restrict her unnecessarily since she can go anywhere she wishes. And I mean, you know, I try to, try to read it without getting teared up. But I think, I think what's important in that and what's hopefully important out of my own work is that this is that incorporating other modes let us go places we need to go and let us discover things that we need to discover. So I think about it in terms of uh, myself, you know, in bringing these other modes, rather than sort of fitting pieces in, it opened spaces up, and that my research process became more journey, more uh, sort of adventure of discovery than, you know, you've got to fill in that last little brick that somebody's supposed to do. Um, and I think as educators, as people, as students, as whatever we are, I think when we encourage, and when you encourage those ways of learning to count, to be cultivated. I think it allows us to go in all kinds of directions that we need to go. And, and it's really something I hope as, as a society that we really embrace that and see the value of it. And I, I think that's very much what this institution is here to do. So with that, I want to say thank you.